yet another edition of Expressions with the New Indian Express. I have with me Professor Vikram Patel of the Harvard Medical School, one of the world's foremost uh, mental health experts and someone who's actually done work right down to the grassroots. He's uh, founded uh, a not-for-profit called Sangat, which has been working in uh, Goa, which is a, a really good partnership, as he was just telling me, with the Madhya Pradesh government as well. And he's been uh, really important in bringing awareness of uh, uh, the mental health problem in India, uh, which has been quite, quite uh, incredible in the way it has uh, looked at patients. Uh, uh, and I think uh, that's just one of the many things that he's done uh, to bring awareness of this crisis, uh, and especially during COVID, uh, where we've talked about the pandemic, but the other silent uh, epidemic really has been the mental health crisis. So thank you so much for joining us from Boston. Uh, cold, cold Boston, I imagine, uh, uh, Professor Patel. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, really, let's talk about the silent epidemic, uh, uh, you know, while this uh, other epidemic was uh, raging. I think uh, what you said about the act is extremely important. I completely agree with you. I think it is the first, um, uh, you know, entitlements-based legislation for healthcare in India, which is yes. quite interesting when you think about it. Um, in a country in which uh, our political parties are often very polarized, um, that mental health should be the one subject that had bipartisan, multi-partisan agreement and where all sides got together. And it's interesting, it's the same in the US. Um, you know, where there may be enormous polarization on every single issue, but not on mental health. So it's important to first acknowledge um, that we're a unique point in history where all political parties, regardless of what the situation is ideologically, all agree that mental health is a very important subject. Um, and in fact, there's even more agreement on mental health and physical health when it comes to the role of the state. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that is another very interesting thing in the U.S. as well, where, you know, you know, there are huge divisions about the role of government when it comes to health care. There is much less disagreement when it comes to mental health care. So I think this, this is a really important, uh, uh, you know, starting point for our conversation. Um, and we can talk about how we got to this incredible point. But it is important to remember that there is tremendous political will nationally, globally, at all levels now, from the UN Secretary General to you know, government leaders on mental health. The question now is, what do we need to see action on the ground? Yes. And, and uh, Doctor, the thing about uh, the Mental Health uh, Act as well, I just want to uh, come back to it, is that it puts the patient uh, or the uh, you know, the affected person, bang in the center of it, you know, it doesn't treat him like uh, a, a criminal, it doesn't uh, stigmatize him, it, it actually gives him or her uh, far more rights than he or she has ever had. Uh, if we look at some of the, uh, you know, the, the mental health institutions that we're all familiar with, they're really like Dickensian, uh, you know, out of Dickensian novels. So I think that, of course, is the next step to reform them. And you uh, have also talked about that at length. But can we also talk about this whole destigmatization of mental uh, health illnesses? So I think these two issues are connected. Yeah. You know, a right space approach to mental health and destigmatization are actually two sides of the same coin. And let me explain why. We often think of stigma uh, to do with mental health problems as emerging because people are unaware yeah. about the nature of mental health problems. They're not empathetic, they're not compassionate, or they have some kind of old fashioned ideas to do with spiritual and supernatural causation. I, I don't think that that is actually the main reason for stigma because stigma occurs in every society around the world. And it is not the case that every single culture around the world has exactly the same ideas about mental illness. That's impossible. The one thing that every society shares around the world is the way that the medical system has dealt with people with mental illness over the centuries. Whatever that medical system was, you know, 200 years ago, it would have been some other system. Over the last 100 years, the dominant system has been biomedicine and psychiatry as a discipline of biomedicine. And so let us for a moment think about what biomedicine has done for people with serious mental illness. It is the only health condition in which you're likely to be imprisoned against your wishes. 
Yes. You know, no, no, nobody with breast cancer will be carted off by the police to a magistrate's court. But yes. if you have a mental illness, you will be mm. in, in certain circumstances. No other condition ha involves you being locked away in what is called a hospital, far away from the city, far away from everyone else, and where no one else can enter that building. What kind of hospital is that? So if you think of that, and the third is, the interventions are entirely hospital-based, nothing in the community, yeah. and they're totally focused on sedative medication. This has been the dominant paradigm of mental health care universally for a century. Yes. So in effect, there is enormous fear. There is enormous fear about the label of mental illness because you will be stripped of your citizenship rights. You'll be stripped of your right to marry. You'll be stripped of your right to inherit. In some countries, you were stripped of your right to vote. You cease to be an individual. Yeah. Then you are risking the chances of being locked away by the police in a prison or in a prison-like hospital and being doped up to your eyeballs with no recourse to get out. Yeah. Why would there not be stigma? Yeah. I mean, think about it. It's an absurdity. So where we really need to address stigma is through the way we address mental health problems from a community focus, rights-based perspective, in which the rights of a person to choose the care they receive in a place of their choice must be paramount. Right. And uh, let's talk about how we've come to this point, uh, Dr. Patelin. How COVID, has it exacerbated this situation? Has it made people understand or has it made people understand less? I think certainly COVID has, has enormously benefited the situation by creating an open conversation about mental health. I mean, let's be honest, the number of, uh, the, the amount of interest there is um, on mental health. I mean, from my own personal experience, a number of webinars I've done for companies, for newspapers and so on, on mental health in this last six months, I probably have done more than I have done in the last five years. Right. Um, and this is entirely a reflection of, uh, you know, the enormous interest in mental health, which of course comes from the personal experiences that people have around the country and the world. The problem is this. The problem is that the conversations are very much around a kind of reaction of one's mind to a very extreme, extraordinary situation yeah. rather than mental illness. Yeah. Um, and so why we should acknowledge and welcome the conversations about uh, the stressful circumstances we all face, we should not medicalize it. You know, I don't think we should ever medicalize what is happening in our minds in a reaction to the pandemic. But equally, we should recognize that this is not the same subject mm. as the issues around access to quality care, a respectful rights-based care for people with mental illnesses, because only a minority of the people who are feeling stressed actually have a mental illness. Yeah. Because for most people, these stressful uh, experiences are normative. You know, they're part of the normative human mind's response to a very extraordinary situation. Right. That's interesting. And, and uh, Doctor, here is, of course, also where you talk about the kind of care and the democratization of care. And you've often talked of the uh, fact that even if we don't have enough psychiatrists as we go on and on, you know, talking about the lack of psychiatrists we have in India compared to the global norm, you've often talked about the democratization of, uh, uh, you know, healthcare. Let's talk a little about that and the, the uh, approach that you have. So let me first say, Kaveri, and let me give credit to the approach that I have been uh, following to the fact that this is an approach that many people before me uh, have actually followed. And that's the idea that healthcare is a plural yeah. uh, uh, delivery system where multiple different kinds of providers need to work in a coordinated way. No one size fits all. And perhaps the greatest champion uh, of this has been the community health worker movement in India, which is, you know, decades old. Uh, in fact, you know, India has the largest community health worker program in the world. Uh, and one has to give credit to the incredible innovations that NGOs initiated in this country, the support they got from state governments around the country from initially governments like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand. And now, of course, it is a federal national program. So we must acknowledge that, that community health workers have been playing profoundly important roles, much of the improvement we have seen in India in reducing maternal and infant mortality is at the hands of the community health worker innovation. Okay, yes, it's not about the, the, the ASHAs, the ANMs, the Anganwadi workers. It's a range of different. Now we have the health and wellness center with a community health officer. You know, so there's various garbs they wear and under different programs, different ministries. But you know, the essence is the same. 
And I think we should acknowledge that it wasn't the obstetrical gynecologist who brought maternal and infant mortality down without the active role of the ASHA mobilizing women to come to hospital to have their babies there. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a team. It's a team that we have to consider. So I've simply taken this, um, this idea, which is very old in India, and applied it to mental health. That's all I've done. Uh, there's nothing radical about it. Uh, the only radical piece, if there is any, is the fact that historically mental health care was thought of as being so complicated yes. that, you know, only somebody with a very high degree of training uh, could, uh, could deliver it. We've been able to demonstrate in India and as well in many other countries around the world now that actually with appropriate training and supervision, community-based workers can also do this in the same way that they can also help mothers with newborn infections. Right. So uh, again, uh, you've had to destigmatize it, and also, as you were just saying a minute ago, demedicalize it. Is that important to separate uh, the mental health care from the sedative aspect of it? So let me be clear. I think what I do is medical in the sense that um, we are dealing with clinically significant mental health conditions. Right. Okay, so let me be very clear about that. Right. When you use the word demedicalize, where I will agree with you is that um, if that implies that all people with mental health conditions need to see an MD, that I disagree with. Right. Uh, you know, so I would say democratize is a better word. That you know, we have to tailor interventions for people according to their need and according to the resource availability. So for example, if I lived in a remote hamlet yeah. somewhere in India where there was no psychiatrist or psychologist available for a hundred kilometers, but there was an Asha who was available in the next house, hmm. that should be my first point of call. Okay. That is what community-based primary care should look like rather than asking you to trek a whole day to see a doctor somewhere far away. Let me also say one more thing. Most mental health professionals are not equipped even to actually deal with community-based issues because they have never actually worked in the community. They have mostly worked in hospital settings. So they're very well skilled with dealing with complex, severe, acute kinds of presentations. But the more common mood, anxiety, and trauma-related conditions that are very intertwined with people's social lives right. and therefore their community lives, I most, most, you know, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I never stepped out of my hospital until I chose after my training to d dedicate my life to a community health. But otherwise, during my training, I never stepped out of the hospital. So right. there's nothing that really prepares me in right. the way that an ASHA or an AM or an Anganwadi worker or a community health officer actually has in terms of firsthand boots on the ground experience of real communities. Uh, has the new uh, architecture for medical education in India, has it taken note of this? I, I believe, you know, I haven't done a deep study on this, Kaveri, and I don't want to comment, but I, my, my understanding is there is certainly a much stronger appreciation that ed medical education in India, which for far too long has been a, a clone yeah. of the education in Britain, um, you know, basically transplanted to India, uh, like so many things, mm -hmm. you know, I think there is a genuine effort to, uh, to, to, to make it more relevant to our context. I mean, it is, it is so incredible. When I think of my medical education, I was trained better to work in a hospital in the US or in a private hospital in India than I was to work in a primary health center in my own country. Yeah. And I think that, that, is a, that, is, that has to change. And I believe that the, the, the proposed new curriculum is strengthening much more the roots of the curriculum with India's contextual realities. Right. I think that would be quite heartening. Uh, but but uh, Dr. Patel, I also want to uh, focus again on pandemic and the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, cases that we've seen from the really well known to, uh, you know, to uh, things that have not come to the fore. For instance, the Shushan Singh Rajput suicide brought so much attention, good and bad, to uh, the conversation. Uh, what has your understanding been now, eight months down the line? Are we aware of the contours of what, what is the size of this mental health crisis in India and uh, globally? So let me just say first about the uh, Sushant Singh Rajput uh, suicide. It, it has nothing to do with mental health. Yeah. His tragic death was related to his poor mental health. Yeah. But the media attention around this, as you know very well, is a perverse, almost vulgar, obscene way 
in which uh, certain sections of the media have violated his family's rights to privacy, as well as the, the rights of his, uh, his, uh, his friends and, and partners. And I think that is enough to be said about that. I don't want to say anything more, right. but let's be clear. There was no compassion. There was nothing about mental health. It no was empathy. Cool. No, not at all, not at all. And whoever is behind all of those, um, that intrusion into their lives is guilty of violation of those basic rights. But let's leave that aside. They have to sleep at night themselves uh, and they have to deal with their own conscience. But let's turn to your question about the uh, the eight months, you know. Yes. Uh, so I do, I, you know, we don't actually have any data, a really good data from India. Uh, so I can't comment on India, but I, I'll, I'll be surprised if the situation in India is any different from the US. Because across the world, one thing that the pandemic has done has created very similar, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, risk factors for, for mental health problems. For example, the economic uncertainty. Yeah. For example, for young people, the uncertainty about jobs, about education and so on. So there's a lot of parallels. And in the US, there is actually data coming from the, uh, from the uh, CDC showing a dramatic increase in the prevalence rates of mood, anxiety, and trauma-related mental health conditions. Dramatic meaning almost twofold, particularly in young adults, um, which is a high-risk group for the emergence of mental health problems. But also, it's a group that has suffered the most, not because of the virus, because you know, curiously, the virus is almost harmless in young people. Yeah. But the consequences of yeah. controlling the virus has affected young people the most. So you see dramatic increases, plus the initial signals of an uptick in suicide mortality. So uh, I think it is really important for us not to wait for those data to come from India. Yeah. There's no need for us to wait to see whether there is a problem that's increasing. We already had a huge problem before the pandemic. Now is the time to act to make sure that the amazing science we have in India on how we can deliver mental health care, regardless of how many mental health professionals we have, that that is actually adequately financed and delivered across the country. How do we do that, uh, uh, doctor? Do we do that at the state level? Do we do that at the central level? Is there one model that you can suggest? Uh, are there two or three basic things that need to be done? Yeah, well, you know, actually, state is uh, health is a state subject, so it has yeah. to be done. It has to be but, done. You know, uh, uh, but obviously, the center plays a role in the amount of money it gives. I mean, that is the main thing. But ultimately, it's a state level, and you know, many states are doing some pretty amazing things, like Kerala. I heard recently a, a, health, a health secretary from Chhattisgarh describing a, a, com, a, you know, what looked like an almost a model mental health program in that state. So I think there are many states that are doing various things at the central level. We have the helplines and so on. So, you know, one has to give credit uh, to all, all these efforts. But I think on a massive scale, what we really need is a system to train and create quality in the delivery of care for India's army of frontline workers. Yeah. You know, when each state does their own thing, you know, imagine we're talking of a million plus frontline workers. How can you train a million frontline workers yeah. in this kind of format? So what Sangat is doing in partnership with the Madhya Pradesh government uh, is actually piloting a digital platform through which Asha's can download an app and learn evidence-based treatments through very systematically designed online curricula, which can be downloaded. So you don't even need the internet actually. Yeah. And then now we are building uh, 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 with, with, we're looking for funding and we're almost certainly gonna get it. We're building the supervision platform so that essentially think about this and Asha can essentially take a phone. She can essentially download the app. She can learn foundational skills for mental health care. She can learn uh, the brief depression treatment that we somehow developed uh, and evaluated. She can then learn new treatments for uh, mental health promotion and so on, all on her phone in the evenings, in the daytime, in the, on the weekends at her own leisure she can then complete the exam on her phone. Wow. And then she can start seeing patients supported by tools on her phone, as well as supervision that is done through audio, you know, uh, basically um, uh, this sort of uh, webinar format. Now, it, this would mean that once you have, let's say, Hindi curriculum ready, you can train every Hindi speaking Asha within three months in the whole country. Yeah. So that is the kind of goal we're going towards, you know, like a massive scale up. Uh, you know, and uh, we're lucky that we already have some support from the Tata Trust uh, to begin to take our work in Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, you know, which was originally research. Now it's being translated into these tools that are scale up. We're looking for funding from some other partners in India through CSR. But what's interesting, Kaveri, and this would really interest you and, and your listeners, is this, that we're doing exactly the same thing in the U.S., 
Yeah. And so we are taking an innovation that came in India, came from wow. India, and we're transplanting it to the US. And in India and the US, we're working simultaneously to build these digital platforms for training uh, frontline workers uh, and with the same treatments as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the US, this is being done by Harvard Medical School in partnership with implementers. And in India, it's being done by Sangha. Wow. And who are the frontline workers in the US? Who are the equivalents? You know, the interesting thing is the US has started its own movement for community health workers. Oh. Uh, so there are now community health workers operating in many states and Massachusetts where I live. Um, there is a community health worker association. Uh, but the program that we're doing, which is called Empower, uh, which is being done in India and the US, it's being done in the state of Texas. Um, and there again, there are community health workers. Their roles are very much like the community health workers in India. They work typically in partnership with the primary health or community health centers, exactly like in India, really. Um, so, you know, you think that the U.S. is only, uh, you know, bio, you know, top heavy. Yeah. Actually, there are community health workers, but it is not a national program like you see in India. They don't have a national kind of a mandate, as you see in India. Uh, but at the state level, there are many states that are using community health workers, and that's the group we're working with. That's that's really amazing. And uh, doctor, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, earlier on, you had said that it was so surprising that there was a consensus on mental health, of course, a really good surprise. But how come there is, uh, you know, normally you find so much polarization when it comes to healthcare uh, between political parties, you know, pushing any uh, health reform agenda is uh, the most painful, I think, you know, whether it was Obama or whether it was Clinton. So how come there's consensus on this? How come people have that level of empathy among uh, what doesn't seem to be a very empathetic political leadership? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I can only speculate, Kaveri. I mean, you know, I'd love to actually have, uh, you know, ask, ask the leaders of different parties why they supported it. But I will tell you why one experience, which was listening to the debates in uh, the Lok Sabha when the Mental Health Care Act was being debated. And it went on for quite a few hours now, if I remember, you know, and of course we had a dynamic health secretary then, and you know, one must credit that these things don't happen out of thin air. You know, you, you need someone holding the baby, you know, at, at the top. And, you know, Shri Kesha Desi Raju, who was the health secretary uh, in, in the government of India at the time, was remarkable. He was truly a remarkable man for his, yeah, he took a singular leadership and it was under him so much happened, you know, on the mental health landscape in India. But when it finally came, uh, you know, it's interesting. First of all, you know, he was a UPA health secretary and then he retired and when the NDA came on. Uh, but the, and so the bill could have lapsed yeah. completely, but it didn't. Yeah. It was renewed and it is so it's uh, this is a bill that began uh, in the uh, with a Congress UPA leadership. There was stiff opposition, by the way, from whom from the psychiatric community. It's interesting, the Indian Psychiatric Society, you know, vociferously opposed it because they felt it diluted. Uh, you know, some of the important medical issues. And I don't want to go into that conversation, but they, they opposed it. So you could have imagined the bill could have been killed very easily yeah, because sure, of the yeah. power of uh, the medical establishment. But actually it was resurrected. There was bipartisan agreement. And I listened to some of the uh, uh, comments that people made in the house. And it was all about personal, personal experiences. My mother, my brother, my, you know, my neighbor, my friend. And you see, I think that, is what made the difference, is yeah. that people can see how the system has failed people close to you in a way that has no parallel with physical health problems. Absolutely. You know, people will not say, oh, my mother had diabetes, you know, she didn't get care. No, I mean, but my mother had depression as my mother did. And then, you know, you, you, you say, oh, actually there was no way she could get care from. And I think that personal experience, I believe is a very powerful driver for this kind of you know, motivation across the aisle to, to reform the mental health care system. You talked about that, uh, doctor. It's such a deeply personal experience for everyone. And even now there's so much stigma or there's so much fear attached to speaking uh, up about it. You know, it could be your son, it could be your mother, it could be your daughter. No one really still wants to talk about it. When are we going to get over this? It's happening slowly, Kaveri. Let me tell you, I've been in this work, you know, 25 years. I am very reassured by the change I have seen. Okay. You know, if you just look at this as a snapshot in time, it can be demoralizing. You know, people are still have a lot of fear, etc. But actually, when you look at it over time, uh, it there has been a dramatic opening up of conversations about mental health, you know, 
on a personal perspective, I remember 25 years ago, my family would be a little embarrassed to tell, you know, relatives or, you know, diapers. Today, it's, they're proud of, proud of it, yeah. you know? So I, I do think that, you know, there is a definite change in attitudes. Um, it takes time, you know, let's not forget, you know, HIV AIDS was such a feared and stigmatized condition. And, you know, look at the transformation. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, we should draw the, you know, think of what transformed HIV AIDS from a feared disease to what uh, today is just another, another health problem. Yeah. And I think a lot of it had to do with leadership. Uh, you know, Sujata Rao, who was the health secretary at yeah. the time and headed NACO and her, uh, her fabulous leadership around the AIDS control program, legislation uh, that was protecting the rights of people with HIV, the empowerment of vulnerable groups for HIV, sex workers, uh, yeah. uh, you know, sexual minorities, et cetera. And fourth, the availability of community-based care. Okay. You know, the, the, the decentralization, the availability of antiretroviral medication for free by the government, you know, it's the only, only medication program that is totally free. Yeah. First gen, you know, first level, second level, all levels. So I think what, what we, one can see the ingredients of the success of India's HIV control program in all of these ways. And I think it is not difficult to imagine how these can be translated into the mental health space. That's so wonderful. Are people thinking along these lines? Uh, is is there is there a sort of consolidated consensus around this? I think there is. I think there is. Let's be clear, though. There was one big difference. HIV never had a professional body behind it. That's you know, mental health has very powerful professional bodies, and I think what we really need is to get on board our professional bodies, like the Indian Psychiatric Society. Yeah. I think they must be, they must feel that they are partners in this kind of radical new world of mental health care. There was never an Indian association of HIV AIDS that could yeah. feel you know, um, that they were being left out or they could even be oppositional because there was this, there is no specialty of HIV medicine in India, at least not at that time. So I think, uh, I, I think we need to find a, a partnership which is mutually respectful between the more public health approach to mental health care, which is what people like myself and my co colleagues in India embrace, and, and the psychiatric approach. I think they're both needed. They both have a place in mental health care, and we should never see this as, as, as alternatives. It right. has to be a continuum of care. Right. Uh, I wonder, can uh, India not become a global health leader with such innovations? I mean, uh, the same innovation could be used in fighting the coronavirus, you know, uh, are, are there not, uh, do we not have the seeds of uh, becoming a global health leader in all these areas? So, you know, I, I you know, I won't say much we about it. Sorry, I was just saying we already export, I think, the largest number of doctors to the US yeah. and to the UK anyway. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, I tell you what, let me tell you, our greatest asset and I want to repeat what I said earlier here, is our community health workers. Right. Yeah, This is the single greatest human resource asset in India's healthcare system. And it not recognized not, enough. Well, I think, I think the government, uh, you know, does recognize, I mean, the, without government support, it would not have happened, right? So there is recognition. But I think not enough is maybe true. Uh, you know, I have served on the National ASHA Mentoring Group of the uh, uh, NHSRC now for a decade. And I, I know that we have constant conversations about how to reduce the burden on the ASHA, how to make sure she feels, uh, you know, she's better compensated. I mean, she's the most important person with the least power and the least space, exactly. you know, and I think we need to we need to equalize that. We need to be more proportionate. But let, let me say this. If I look at the COVID-19 response, the thing that is really going to save India uh, has been the, the, the frontline worker, the frontline worker in our villages who is being put at her own risk to go identify people, uh, to help contact trace them, you know, cases, you know, to help support health quarantine, et cetera. This is our greatest asset, Kaveri. The idea of the community health worker is being exported. It is, India is not the only place where it's happened. Of course, it's happened in many other countries in Africa, for example, but it is our greatest asset. And the more we acknowledge these incredible women, the more we give them respect in the form of compensation, you know, respect is not just giving them a uniform. Yeah. I think the greater will be our healthcare system success stories. Right. Um, uh, what else have, have you learned through this uh, other silent uh, epidemic that has raged over the eight months? What, what have your learnings been? 
I think for me, when I look at the whole story, the fact that we do not have a public health authority in India has been the single most important. Uh, we don't have the equivalent, for example, like in the US or the CDC. Right. You know, it doesn't exist. Uh, you know, there are sort of certain offices. So ICMR or, you know. So ICMR is not like that. ICMR is like the NIH. It's a yeah. research agency. So, exactly. you know, you would not ask a medical research institution to guide a public health response to right. a infectious disease pandemic. No other country does that. Right. Um, we have a very peculiar situation where ICMR, whose role is to fund research. So, they, you know, I think ICMR plays a very important role in funding, say, a vaccine trial. Yeah. Uh, but to guide epidemic control, ICMR is, has no expertise of its own. Yeah. Yeah. You need a public health agency, you know, and actually India does not have it has no Department of Public Health. It has no, uh, you know, uh, no equivalent of the CDC. Uh, and I think that is a very obvious glaring uh, uh, issue in our country. Today, for example, consider the vaccine rollout plans. You know, every time there is an issue, you have to form a new committee. Yeah. Uh, but that's because we don't actually have an institution. Um, yeah. and, I, and I believe that that is the need of the hour. I believe that is a single most important lesson. This is not the last pandemic that's going to hit us. Yeah. And I think one thing the government I would advocate should be doing is setting up an equivalent of the CDC that is intersectoral. That's very important. It's not under the Ministry of Health. Because if you think about epidemic control strategies, you have to involve multiple ministries, the Home Ministry, the Ministry of Employment, of Youth Affairs, Education. So it has to be intersectoral because right. every sector is affected. Um, and I think that is what we need. And, you know, something like this should maybe even be at the level of the PMO. You know, it's something, you know, cross-sectoral or right. like the Niti Aayoga, something like that. Um, we don't have it. And yeah. that has been made so obvious in the way that we've uh, generally responded to the pandemic. Right. Uh, uh, and also, I think we've uh, tended to underscore, uh, under, um, uh, shall we say, undervalue the importance of epidemiologists and uh, place for emphasis on the non-communicable diseases uh, for a long time. Isn't that true, doctor? Well, first of all, epidemiology is the foundational science of public health. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Actually, when you look at many of the people who have been put in positions of decision making, yeah. they are clinicians. Yes. You know, and I think these are totally different. And this goes back to our earlier conversation. Right. Are you seeing the pandemic from a population perspective or from the perspective of the individual with COVID-19? Mm -hmm. You need actually the latter, a population perspective for right. prevention. Whereas what we've done is we've for so long talked about ventilators, plasma therapy, yeah. and this, that, and the other, which is important for the 0.1 or 5% of people who land up in hospital. What we have to do is to actually emphasize the large population that is asymptomatic or pre you know, has not been exposed. How do we control uh, the infection in that population? And unfortunately, that kind of tech, you know, skill, which is epidemiological, is much weaker in, 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 in the ministries of health and so on. And I think that's why I believe a public health agency of India is so desperately needed. Right. As long as we don't treat uh, uh, them the way Trump treats Fauci. Well, you know what, Fauci is a very highly regarded person in the medical yeah, community in absolutely. this country. And actually, Fauci is an interesting because he's both a clinician and a public health leader. He's actually everything. You know, he's a multi, there's very few people you know, I mean, I, you know, you can consider like like Tony Fauci. But I think one thing I will say is that the U.S. has got both an independent research organization as well as a public health organization. And I think for mental health, since we were talking about that, there's also an independent cross-sectoral multi mental health organization called SAMHSA. So I think these sorts of institutional structures might be really useful for India to also explore how that can be applied in, in because India and the US share a lot in common. These are federal countries with, yeah. where health is a state subject. Uh, these are countries in which um, there is uh, uh, enormous diversity uh, across the country. And also there's a very fragmented healthcare system. They're very similar in that way. You know, There's a very strong private sector in both countries and so on. So I think there's a lot of lessons I find as I live you know, split, uh, split my life between India and the yeah. US, I find a lot of parallels and I keep thinking of lessons I take from the US to India and vice versa. Right, that's that's so good. Um, you know, I wanted to draw your attention that we have today to the community. Uh, we've talked about the community at the individual level. What about the community institutions? You know, so far the public institutions we have for mental health 
have really been very grim. Uh, uh, you know, is there is there some reform that's likely? How do they? Uh, how uh, will they be reformed? Because the private health institutions, private mental health institutions, are still pretty much out of reach of the common person. Yeah, so I think we have to recognize, Kaveri, that India has a plural healthcare system, and you know the the private sector now has a big role, particularly in outpatient care, uh, and particularly in urban areas. Uh, you know, so I think there's no question that we, you know, the private sector has a role. I think what we must look at is regulation of both the private and the public sector, because a lot of uh, out-of-pocket expenditure is because of unnecessary medical care. Um, you know, and by the way, this applies in both sectors because a lot of uh, public sector is not free because, you know, many public sector places, you don't have medications available. You have to often buy devices. So, you know, irrational prescription of, of surgery, of medicines and, and, and medical devices is often a very important cause of out-of-pocket expenditure. So, you know, regulation and quality control is a very, accountability is something that we need across both sectors. And secondly, uh, you know, for the large numbers of people who cannot access private care because of costs, you know, really there is no excuse not to invest in the public healthcare system. We have got cost-effective strategies. We've demonstrated time and again that community health workers can deliver interventions for everything from autism through to depression, alcohol abuse, and psychosis. Uh, so there is no reason why there is, uh, you know, the government does not have a model to actually invest in. We know how to do it. Um, and I think therefore that is the need of the hour is to invest massively uh, in, in the public mental health sector, but at the base of the foundation, at the community and primary care level. Right, and, and to reform the existing institutions as well. Absolutely, I would say that's important. Uh, you know, I think the institutions do play a role. I, I would, but reforming is the right word, not shutting them down. I'd yeah. say reforming them to make them open institutions where there is uh, open access to families to visit. People can go in and out. It's like a, it's like a hospital. Yeah. You know, it's not like a prison. It's not it like moves a prison. From a prison to becoming a hospital, a genuine hospital, just like any other uh, general uh, medical hospital. Yeah, is that happening, doctor? At any, yeah, yeah, it's any, happening in many, uh, many hospitals. You know, it again depends very much on local leadership. And those hospitals where there is a really, you know, a, a, you know, motivated medical superintendent, um, it's definitely happening. It's not happening in every hospital at the same pace, but it's definitely happening. And, you know, one has to also thank the National Human Rights Commission for this, because it was the NHRC, which really, uh, you know, you know, passed a diktat uh, more than a decade ago, uh, demanding an immediate, uh, you know, reformation. And now they have to be visits, there's a visitors committee and so on. So I think, the NHRC has done a really good job, and in, in, uh, we still have some way to go. Uh, but but I think in many many hospitals, reform is happening. Are you optimistic about uh, the mental health uh, care and the mental health architecture in India? And what do you think is the next big step that should be taken? I'm very optimistic, Avery. I see for many reasons. I see a far greater openness to have conversations about mental health. Stigma is definitely reduced uh, dramatically. Uh, and you know we've discussed that. Secondly, uh, there is a very clear science demonstrating the effectiveness of community health worker delivered interventions for mental health problems. That's very important, by the way. 10 years ago, we did not have that science. Now we do. There is a complete acknowledgment of the science by the government in its national mental health policy, but also globally. So this idea is not just India specific. It's become a global idea. So uh, I think uh, these are all things that make me very much more optimistic than 10 years ago. Uh, now what we need actually is a very specific dedication of money that goes to translating the science into action. Right now, all of the funding that, for example, Sangat receives is from private foundations and international research organizations. I would look forward to the day when organizations like Sangat are financed by the government Right. through its own public funds so that it does not have to rely on private money and international money, but can actually receive local money from the government of India to do the government of India's mandate uh, to improve access to mental health care. Yeah, just the last question here. Do you see the, uh, the, the wellness centers under the Ayushman Bharat uh, uh, emerging as possible mental health uh, sort of uh, centers? Absolutely. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the best 
location in the healthcare system for all health promotion activities. Yeah. And it's important also not to see mental health problems isolated from other non-communicable diseases because they often coexist, diabetes, substance use, alcohol use, heart disease, et cetera, uh, and depression. Our examples, they often coexist. So really seeing this, the, the health and wellness center as a place for person-centered care where a person's health needs are holistically addressed right. um, through a combination of medic drug and psychosocial interventions is, is the need of the art. It's a great opportunity and the platforms we're building uh, you know, for digital training and quality assurance are perfectly suited for that kind of uh, 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 provider. Great. I hope we speak in another six months and we can actually talk through some of the major changes that have happened on the ground. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining you, us Dr. and for clarifying so many uh, issues that we have on this issue, uh, on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Kaveri. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.